happening tonight in Vancouver. It seems to be mainly like young single mothers from what I've noticed that he seems to like post their photos of their kids. Harassing and impersonating women and children online. That is what appears to be happening through a number of social media accounts believed to be run by one person based in the greater Vancouver area. Five of the alleged victims come forward to City News. If you are fully vaccinated, um, we're going to uh, allow for easing of restrictions and uh, uh, allow for more travel. Plans announced for fully vaccinated Canadian travellers. Not included in those plans, reopening the Canada-US land border. I think the more people know about sexualized violence, I think the more better understanding there is. And one of the really key things that come out, comes out of education is folks being able to respond properly, empathetically, so, like supportively. The BC government is out with new resources said to help with prevention and education around sexual violence and misconduct. Will this make it easier for victims of sexual assault to get the support they need? This is City News Everywhere. I don't know about everybody else, but I feel violated and angry. He messages yeah. me daily. Like, uncomfortable and unsafe just as a woman. Dozens of Instagram accounts have been harassing women and children in the Lower Mainland, apparently stealing family photos, tracking down phone numbers, and inundating them with emails. We spoke with five women who say they believe it's all being done by one person. And despite going to the police, they say nothing is being done. He's made, like, yeah. 11, maybe more accounts of my and some of them are even like provocative things. The Instagram user appears to have a variety of accounts and often can be identified by their red profile pictures. On the social media pages, photos of primarily women and children are shared, tagging the person and writing captions like my little freak and heart and kissing emojis. But according to all the Women City News spoke with, as well as the comments on the pages, this is being done without any of the women's permission. Alicia Levesque lives in Chilliwack with her almost four-year-old daughter, Emma. She says she was the first woman to be targeted and believes the person behind the accounts went to high school with her. He, like, posted a picture of me, and then I was getting kind of, like, creeped out about it, and then he started posting my daughter. And at that point, I was like, okay, this is not okay. So I messaged him. I was like, what are you doing? Like, you don't have permission to post my daughter? <laughs> And he started getting really creepy about it and started making like a bunch of profiles of my daughter. Levesque says the harassment began in 2014 and has gotten progressively worse. Even if it's not the same girl every day, he'll just find new people and go through all of their friends and families and like all of their followers to see like who has the most stuff, you know, like who has like pictures of family members on there who's like, it seems to be mainly like young single mothers from what I've noticed that he seems to like post their photos of their kids. One of the women, Jade Charlton, has started a group chat for all those affected by the social media accounts and says so far she has over 80 women who have joined and shared their encounters with the social media pages. I stopped answering him and I think that's why he's messaging me more. But I don't like... It's like three, four times a day now. Chilliwack RCMP confirmed they have received a complaint about the accounts, telling City News they instructed the women to block the account and report the incident to the social media platform. Police, at, in some ways, actually are a little bit hand-tied because unless it meets a threshold for active investigation or when it comes down to it, uh, recommendation from Crown for charges, um, we can feel powerless. So police could say, go and report it to you know Facebook or Instagram, which is fair. That is part of the terms of service if you have a concern but within that every instance that we have on social media where somebody does something that we that we don't like isn't necessarily a criminal act you know despite even being told don't turn this into a manhunt we're not given the option it's either we turn it into as much of a peaceful manhunt as we can to say please be careful of this individual or we have nothing and he continues doing the things he does. And that's not something I'm going to sit lightly with. At a loss of what more can be done, these women say there should be far more resources for victims of online harassment. In New Westminster, Ashley Burr, City News. If you are fully vaccinated, um, 
we're going to uh, allow for easing of restrictions and uh, uh, allow for more travel. The Prime Minister with a plan up his sleeve to get Canadians travelling again. But that plan does not include opening up the Canada-US land border, at least not for another month. Well, we have to hit our targets of 75% uh, vaccinated with a first dose, uh, at least 20% vaccinated at the second dose uh, before we can start loosening things up. Despite growing calls to allow fully vaccinated travellers the freedom to cross borders, Ottawa is taking a cautious approach. But Trudeau says a plan for fully vaccinated Canadians to return home from abroad will soon be in place. We're going to be working uh, with the Arrive Can app in ways that people can upload uh, an image of their uh, paper proof of vaccination or online proof of vaccination so that uh, the border agents on their return to Canada uh, can verify indeed uh, that they are fully vaccinated. Uh, and that's something that we will have in place uh, in the coming weeks. The Arrive Can app has been used since May. All Canadians returning home must enter travel and health information to ensure travellers are not a threat to others. The long-term plan, Trudeau says he is in discussion with provinces to establish a national certification of vaccine status that will be easily accepted around the world. In Ottawa, Nigel Newlove, City News. BC's overall COVID case numbers continue on a downward trend. The province announced 109 new COVID-19 cases on Friday, 65 of those in the Fraser Health region. 128 people are currently hospitalized in BC, 48 in the ICU. As for vaccination rates across the province, 76.7% of all adults and 75.1% of people over 12 have now received their first first dose of a vaccine. Health officials and the city of Richmond are ramping up their efforts to boost COVID-19 vaccination rates among seniors. The city held the first of two drop-in clinics today at the Senior Centre at Minaru and Granville for Richmond seniors age 65 and older and their caregivers who haven't received their first dose. Richmond is one of the areas where health officials are looking to boost vaccination rates. As of June 14th, 79% of adults Adults in Richmond are aged 50 and up had received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine, while most other lower mainland regions are at over 80% for that age group. The clinic will be open again next Friday. An overnight vaccination clinic believed to be the first in B.C. is taking place in Surrey this weekend, and it's being dubbed the ultimate all-nighter. Fraser Health will be hosting the Vaxathon at the Guilford Recreation Centre in Surrey starting at 11 a.m. on Saturday and lasting until 11 p.m. on Sunday in an effort to get more people their first shot against COVID-19. The Health Authority is dubbing the Saturday night event as Masquerade, while Sunday Sunday is being touted as doses with dad and hopes to vaccinate 7,000 people during the 32-hour blitz. Vaccines will be available to all eligible people 12 years and older in the region who haven't received a first jab. BC's Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Training is out with initiatives that aim to help with preventing and responding to sexual assaults on campus. The Sexual Violence and Response Training Series was developed in tandem with BC Campus and representatives from post-secondary schools right across the province. But what will these resources mean for those who are in need of help. We're not quite at the place of creating deeper systems level change yet. That means tackling oppression, tackling colonialism, tackling racism and sexism. All of these things are at the root of sexualized violence. Ashna Josh manages the Sexual Assault Support Center of UBC's Alma Mater Society. The new program includes training in four areas, consent and sexual violence, supporting survivors, accountability and repairing relationships, and active bystander intervention. Josh says this is just the tip of the iceberg. Minister responsible Anne Kang is proud of the work they've done, but agrees there's still more to do. Being more gender inclusive as well, um, to, to be more culturally inclusive as well. Uh, we want to make sure that survivors of sexual violence are supported um, rather than um, the, the memory and, and having to talk about it brings more pain. So we want to make sure that we are uh, supporting survivors. 
The recently announced steps are getting an overall thumbs up from West Coast Leaf, a group that advocates for gender justice and human rights. Lawyer Humira Jabir agrees it's a good start, but if there was one place she'd recommend improvement, it's in the category of cyber misogyny. Sexualized violence, and it, particularly around the sharing of images, uh, can impact the experiences of post-secondary students. So that's maybe an area in which um, there should be there could be more focus, and I think maybe that will come through in terms of who facilitates the training. It's where she'd like to see more fulsome development. Sexualized violence, it is not it is incurring in person on campuses, uh, but we live in an, in an online age as well, and uh, that has to be part of the consideration. For now, it's about taking those next important steps. I think when people are more equipped, more knowledgeable, have more information about the perspectives required to support survivors, especially on campuses, um, I think this is this is kind of where that change starts to happen, is when someone wants to utilize a policy to get support, sometimes the response isn't the most supportive because people aren't trained to do that. So I think there's a lot of good scope for that. It's just the hope is that it's actively implemented. It's my expectation that the post-secondary institutions will provide uh, some type of feedback or report for me at the end of the year. Um, but uh, definitely, I will be working with all 25 post-secondary institutions in BC. In Vancouver, Rio Renouf, City News. A number of prominent people across Canada and the world have signed a letter to Premier John Horgan demanding an immediate stop to old growth logging. More than 100 people, including scientists, academics, musicians and Olympians, have signed the letter, which calls for the immediate protection of all remaining iconic old growth forests in B.C. Notable signatories include Grand Chief Stuart Fli Phillip, former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, sure former Vancouver Mayor Gregor Robinson, and Swedish activist Greta Thunberg. New bike lockup facilities have been installed at two Metro Vancouver transit hubs. The solar-powered lockers and racks are now in place at Moody Centre Station and the Carvalho Exchange. The bike parking facilities will feature keyless entry and mobile payments. Riders can pay for and access them through the Bike Keep app without needing to book in advance. In the coming months, lockers will be installed at four other transit hubs, Lonsdale Key Exchange, 22nd Street Station, VCC Clark Station, and Richmond Bright House Station. It's a way to share their own stories as urban Indigenous youth and grieve the children lost to residential schools. Grade 6 and 7 students at Britannia Elementary School on Vancouver's downtown east side are finishing up a mural. They've been working on it for a week with the support of a local nonprofit. It'll be unveiled outside of the school's new library and recognizes the remains of 215 children found in Kamloops last month. Those with the school say it's given them a chance to express themselves and have their voices heard. There's an Indigenous component. Um, there is some subtle oranges in the artwork and, uh, and that represents our community and, um, and the Indigenous people on, on, on the land we work and play and live. And so it's just, it's replete with so many different symbols and the kids were, they just wanted it all in there. One thing that stood out to me uh, when the the class was telling me the ideas was the the fact that they were trying to raise awareness of the the findings of of what's happening in residential schools right now and i i didn't want to do anything like in your face so that's why i chose the orange to be like a subtle highlight for that Four students were arrested after several floors of a Nelson High School were vandalized over the weekend in what police are describing as a grad prank gone wrong. The Nelson Police Department says a few students broke into L.V. Rogers Secondary School late Sunday for what seems to have been intended as a graduation prank that soon got out of hand. Photos show hallways and rooms covered in shaving cream, glitter and other substances, including 80 raw chicken eggs. This week in science, talking about the Pine Island Glacier in Antarctica. Now, there are no pines there, but there is 180 trillion tons of ice. 
enough to raise global sea levels half a meter should the whole thing disappear. So it's probably not encouraging to learn then that Pine Island is considered part of the weak underbelly of the West Antarctic ice shelf. That's because what's keeping the glacier from flowing into the ocean is a shelf of floating ice sticking out from its edge. It's kind of like a doorstop, pressing against the sides of the Pine Island Bay and holding back the intense pressure of all that ice behind it. Now, previously, the biggest threat to this doorstop was warm water seeping under the bottom of the shelf and disconnecting it from the ocean floor. But between 2009 and 2017, the flow of ice into the ocean was fairly slow and fairly stable. What's happened since then, though, is different. Now, these are images from the European Space Agency's Sentinel-1 satellites, which were able to take a still image of the glacier every six days. You can see city-sized chunks of ice breaking loose from the shelf and just heading out to sea. One of them, which broke off in 2018, is three times the size of Manhattan. And this breakup is happening pretty fast. One-fifth of the shelf has disappeared since the start of 2017. And the glacier is now flowing towards the ocean 12% faster than before. Now the fear is, the whole ice shelf, that cork in the bottle of the Pine Island Glacier, could be gone in a matter of decades instead of a matter of centuries. It's not really clear what's behind this accelerated breakup. Now the warming climate is responsible for ice loss and sea level rise generally, but that wouldn't account for these giant rifts we're seeing at Pine Island. Regardless of why, coastal communities had better prepare for higher sea levels maybe sooner rather than later. With This Week in Science on City News, I'm News 1130's Curtis Doring. BC is now home to Canada's highest suspension bridge, offering a view of the Rockies and Purcell Mountains. Golden Sky Bridge opened earlier this month in Golden, BC, and offers visitors a view 426 feet above a canyon. BC entered step two of its restart plan this week, permitting non-essential travel throughout the province. Health officials say those planning on visiting smaller communities like Golden should check for any local guidance before traveling. Vancouver's news is always available on the radio and news at News 11:30 or online anytime at CityNews1130.com. Your next edition of City News is tonight at 11. Thanks for watching and have a great night.